three o'clock and we are back on schedule. Um, it gives me great honor uh, to introduce our next speaker. As you'll learn more about tomorrow, our ask this year when we meet with the representatives and their staff is for a total funding of $11 million for the CDC for the National Spina Bifida Program that supports clinics throughout the country as well as research. So it's really neat that Dr. Karen Remley is joining us today. Dr. Remley is the director of the CDC's National Center on Birth Defects and Developmental Disabilities. She has worked in public health and healthcare for more than 30 years with leadership roles in both the public and private sector. She has shaped her career around helping every family have the best opportunity for health and well being. Her insight today is going to help us with our work this Tuesday and get a true understanding of the National Spina Bifida Program at the CDC. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Karen Remley. As a reminder, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat and let's try to use the chat for a discussion regarding our speaker. Thank you, Dr. Remley, welcome. Thank you. Um, can you hear me, Heidi? We can, thank you. Good, great, hi. Um, hi, everybody, I'm Karen Remley. Um, and as she said, I'm at the director of the National Center on Birth Defects and Developmental Disabilities. And before I talk about our program and what we do and, and field your questions, I thought I'd share with you um, an experience I had in my very first month as an intern, which you can imagine was a number of years ago, because um, in the 1980s, I took care of um, an eight-year-old little girl with spina bifida and had the privilege of having an incredibly um, astute and talented mother who advocated for her daughter. Um, she had rapid onset of renal failure, and the doctors were trying to blame it on um, not doing a good job with um, her urinary toilet. And the mother said, nothing has changed. This doesn't make sense. Um, and this was back in the days before internet. So I listened to the mom and li listened and listened and searched the literature. And she had a ventriculoatrial shunt. Um, and that shunt was known rarely to cause infection. And that infection with staph could result in renal failure. Long story short, um, she had her shunt replaced with ventricular peritoneal shunt. She had her infection cleared up, her renal function returned to normal. And it was the, the first experience for me in that first month of an internship to understand how incredibly important um, having family around and having patients and their family have the agency to be involved in their care and to really share with um, the physicians, the nurses, and the staff um, what they thought was going on. I, I have to say the attending physicians were not listening. I was a brand new intern who didn't know any better, um, but that family really taught me. Um, and that was one of the first experiences I've ever had that really um, kind of changed my course. So we'll go to the next slide. I want to share with you um, as and before I go there, I hope I, I saw Sarah's name. Um, I just want to recognize Sarah Sturry. She is an amazing friend, leader, public health leader, advocate, and advocate, not just for spina bifida, for all the work the center does. Um, and so just a shout out to you um, because it's wonderful to be able to um, speak to all of you on Sunday. Um, so as a public health agency, we approach things from a population-based perspective. We focus on collecting and using data to provide information about the spina bifida population across the entire lifespan to study and improve, of course, survival and mortality, health outcomes, transitioning from childhood to adulthood and care, interventions, and aging. We implement activities that aim to improve health outcomes for individuals, as I said, really across the lifespan. And this is an area we'll highlight today. Next slide, please. This is a really busy slide, but one we're really very proud of because this shows the incredible work in partnership um, with SBA and with all of you that we've been able to accomplish in this field. The timeline shows you initiatives over time. We've been building a portfolio of spina bifida activities over time, and in more recent years, we are working to incorporate new methods and strategies. I'm going to highlight a few of the really big things. So, of course, back in 2008, we began supporting the National Spina Bifida Patient Registry. It was introducing a framework 
from for a systematic approach to improving the quality of care received at Spino, Sp Spina Bifida Clinics nationwide. And then let's look at 2015. We began supporting the urological management to preserve initial renal function protocol for young children with spina bifida, or affectionately known as umpire. Following that, in 2016, the Skin Breakdown Bundle Project was initiated as a pilot project under the National Spina Bifida Patient Registry. 11 of those clinics have participated in the bundle pilot project that addresses health education, skin assessment, and risk assessment. In 2018, Spina Bifida Association, we and several other federal agencies and professional associations met to discuss the importance of the transition period for people living with disabilities. Outcomes from this meeting included CDC initiating a quality improvement project that focused on transition in 2019 and supporting a second cohort in 2020. And then in 2019, the quality of life pilot was initiated at some of those clinics. Also in 2019, building on the we funded multiple sites to continue research efforts to improve the health of people living with spina bifida. In 2021, we collaborated with the American Academy of Pediatrics to develop and implement a project, a spina bifida project ECHO. The third ECHO cohort started last month and ECHO is really an opportunity to train physicians around how to care for people with spina bifida. In 2021, we also launched a new effort to estimate the prevalence of spina bifida in the United States using large administrative databases. And that's really important because we don't really have an understanding of how many people are truly living in our country um, with spina bifida. And in 2023, building on those projects, we supported AAP to develop a spina bifida toolkit for healthcare providers, which we will be making available online in the coming months. And last week, just really literally last week, we posted a new funding opportunity that will begin later in 2024 to conduct surveillance of spina bifida across the lifespan. This will help us estimate the prevalence of spina bifida across all ages, estimate mortality and survival, describe healthcare utilization and sources of care, and assess health status and long-term outcomes. Next slide, please. So next, um, I wanna highlight our current work, which is focused on research to improve the health of people living with spina bifida. The current funding cycle began in 2019 and runs through 2025. The Spina Bifida Collaborative Care Network is one of three components. The Spina Bifida Association is the awardee, and this effort aims to identify and encourage adoption of best practices based on available evidence for care for people with spina bifida. A big part of this collaborative work is developing and implementing the benchmarking project. In partnership with clinics, we're, the SBA is working to identify and define the complex practices that yield desired outcomes in continence, mobility, and skin breakdown to ensure that all individuals with spina bifida have access to excellent care. And that means wherever you are in this country, whether you have access to a spina bifida clinic or not, how do we make sure you get the care you need and deserve? An aim of this project is to identify system level factors that can contribute to improved health outcomes and to share that information broadly. So more clinics have the option to adopt these attributes. As part of this effort, SBA offers many educational opportunities for individuals living with spina bifida and their families, as well as clinicians and healthcare providers that care for individuals with spina bifida. Next slide, please. And the other component of our current spina bifida research efforts is around the National Spina Bifida Patient Registry. You may hear people talk about the registry or NSBPR. The goal is to collect the longitudinal data on children and adults with spina bifida to identify health care and clinical practices associated with best health outcomes. There are 20 clinics across the country that contribute data to the registry. Most are within major medical institutions. The registry has been successful due to the dedication of the investigators in participating spina bifida clinics and all the patients who participate. 
I want to say thank you to all of you, whether you're a patient, a family member, a clinician, a researcher who are involved in this effort, because it really does take a village. Slide, next slide, please. So who's included and what data is collected? I thought you might want to see some of the data that we've collected recently. This shows our most recent annual data set that captures data through December of 2022. At that time, we had over 11,800 participants in the registry. Almost an even split, as you can see in the green boxes in the slide for male and female. And I see somebody writing in the slide, CHKD, and I gotta tell you, um, Yosef, I may have taken care of you at CHKD because I was a doctor in their emergency room for over 10 years. So it's just fun to see that name. Sorry, guys, I had to just shout that out. Um, participants can enroll in the registry at any age. Current participants range from birth, to 89 years of age. You can see the age breakdown in the orange boxes on the slide where you see the majority um, are in that five to 21 range, but certainly have it on both sides. We collect lots of different data, demographic information, insurance, height and weight, bowel and bladder management techniques, and any surgeries and procedures. Next slide. So here we're highlighting a few findings that have come from that registry. Collaborators have worked together to publish 32 different journal publications on topics such as bladder and bowel health, surgeries and procedures, mobility and ambulation, weight management, education, and transition from pediatric to adult care. The populations provide the public health publications will provide the public health and clinical communities with information that can help us understand more about the spina bifida population, inform and maximize quality care and services, and ultimately improving health outcomes. Next slide. So I mentioned umpire. The third component is a quality improvement effort with the goal of identifying a protocol that informs the optimal timing and frequency of screening and test to manage urinary symptoms for infants and children to preserve kidney function as much as possible. It began in 2015 and initially focused on the first five years of life. In the current funding cycle, which runs through 2025, we expanded the protocol to include the first 10 years of life. Nine spina bifida clinics currently participate in Umpire and they enroll newborns and then follow them over time. Although most babies born with spina bifida have healthy kidneys at birth, they are at higher risk of developing kidney disease or failure than those without spina bifida and are more likely to have urinary tract infections, scarring of the kidneys, and loss of kidney function. This is why umpire is so critically important. Next slide, please. And I wanted to share with you some information that we've been able to get. So we rolled over 600 infants diagnosed with meningomyelocele. We conduct blood tests. The clinics do monitor bladder and kidney function. They watch for infections in the infant's urinary tract for early signs of kidney problems. We um, do the things that you see here, kidney imaging results, bladder function tests, assessments of kidney damage, kidney function and scarring assessment, and creatinine levels, all with the goal of making sure we maximize kidney function in every child. Next slide. And I mentioned that when we were looking at that timeline, collaboration with the American Academy of Pediatrics to improve transition from pediatric to adult care. These are some of those collaborative activities we fund the AAP to do, primarily focused on improving that transition period. So in 2019, we collaborated with the AAP to convene quality improvement experts to come together and design an approach to a spina bifida Healthcare Transition Quality Improvement Learning Collaborative. We then had two learning collaborative cohorts that focused on the transition from pediatric to adult-centered care for youth living with spina bifida. Based on what we learned from the Quality Improvement Project, we collaborate with AAP to implement Project ECHO to provide knowledge, skills, and self-efficacy regarding effective strategies and best practices in promoting successful transitional care services and transitional care programs. And ECHO stands for an Extension for Community Healthcare Outcomes. They've been well-received 
by the attendees and the participants. They have both a lecture portion for the clinicians and a case discussion portion. The 20 minute lectures are presented as part of the cohort are now available on the website so that even if you can't participate in the collaborative, you can we can reach more clinicians with this information. And we just started our third cohort last month. We've also drafted a spina bifida toolkit for healthcare providers with a focus on providing information for adult providers that care for individuals with spina bifida. Next slide. And this is just an example of one of the tools that the AAP has developed. This is an infographic that is available in both Spanish and in English that highlights the important role of care coordination for successful care transition. And this helps clinics with their patients to plan for and anticipate that transition. And this tool, as well as many others, are available on the AAP website. Next slide. As you can tell, we're doing a lot of things with all of you. In collaboration with the Association of University Centers with Disabilities, we're looking to estimate prevalence. Through birth defect surveillance efforts, we know more about how many babies are born with spina bifida. However, we have limited information about how many adults are living with spina bifida. We started a new collaboration with AUCD and the University of Minnesota to support the use of publicly available data. So think about electronic health records and other data that's available to estimate how many people are living with spina bifida in the United States that will encompass all ages. We are using nationally representative databases for both public and private payers to estimate prevalence of spina bifida across the lifespan. And we have presented those preliminary findings at the World Congress last year, and we'll publish them this year. Next slide. And I wanna let you know where we're going next. We have two new activities to highlight. We will be conducting focus groups with individuals living with spina bifida and um, with caregivers for individuals living with spina bifida. It is important that we have ways to hear from the populations we serve. These focus groups are one way we can hear directly from the spina bifida population. We hope to learn more about the lived experience, access to care, and transition to adult care. And the second is we will be looking at ways to identify a population-based sample of children and adults with spina bifida to estimate the prevalence and key outcomes with the goal of identifying opportunities to assess and improve the health of individuals living with spina bifida. And then lastly, we wanna build on state birth defect surveillance programs and link with data sources, such as I said, electronic health records and administrative data, which can be like um, claims from Medicare, Medicaid, hospital discharge information. And I'm gonna to turn to questions, but first I wanna share with you our wide CDC priorities on the next slide. For our agency this year, we are really focusing in th three major areas. One is to improve mental health. And certainly all the work that we do in our center and the work that I've just spoken about will be part of that project. Making sure that we're, we have really done our maximum after COVID to understand um, readiness and response. How do we make sure that our readiness and response programs work for every single person in our country, regardless of what they, um, whether they have disabilities, whether they don't, by age, by location, and then supporting young families. So for our center in particular, that means helping families with children with developmental disabilities, but also children with birth defects, and making sure we have the data to turn that information. And then lastly, we are focusing as an agency on being nimble, being able to use data quickly to turn that information and to really look at health and well-being across the lifespan for children that we serve within our center. Next slide. And I wanna say thank you to everyone on the call today. Um, and then in specific to these groups here, um, so many of you have been so involved with us. I started off thanking Sarah and I would be neglectful if I didn't say to she and her team um, and to our team at the NCBDD who just um, work so tirelessly together with all of you to really make a difference for people with spina bifida. And that is my last slide. So I'd like to open it up and see if we have questions from people that we can answer.
And I would say here on this very last slide, Catherine Riley is the person who is the lead um, around our spina bifida program, is an amazing um, professional. And there is her email address if you have any additional questions that I can't answer today. Thank you, Dr. Remley. I'm going to facilitate the questions. So okay. if people want to drop them in the chat. That is great. Um, I think this is um, a great question because it will allow you to give some more overview of the program. So a question from Sam is, why hasn't Colorado been a part of the registry? So if you can kind of explain that. That, that is a great question. And I would say um, there are a multitude of reasons. One is funding, because you know you want to be able to fund as many um, uh, spina bifida clinics as we can. But as, as you are going to the Hill, I think to, to um, tomorrow, I hear or Tuesday to talk about why that is why they aren't in every spina bifida clinic, because we try and make sure that the spina bifida clinics that are funded have enough funding to be able to gather the information um, to be able to answer the clinical questions that we need to have answered. Um, with more funding, there would be more clinics involved. That's That's a great answer. And so kind of as a follow-up, we we estimate that it costs the federal government, it could cost the federal government if they funded us at $11 million, uh, $45 per year for every individual with spina bifida in this country. And um, you haven't gotten to where you are in your career without probably navigating politics. So can you give us some good other kind of keywords, catchphrases, uh, that we can use when we're meeting uh, with the representatives on Tuesday to get their attention and make it click for them. Sure. Um, you know, I think one of the things, and, and for those of you who go, I think you can talk about what a difference going to a spina bifida clinic, going to physicians that have the knowledge and experience and nurses to be able to help you navigate the healthcare system and get the quality care you deserve. But that not there is not a spina bifida clinic in every community around the country. So that funding is really not just to determine what quality care is, but to make sure that every patient, no matter where they are, every individual with spina bifida has access to that same type of care and that same quality of care. So being able to disseminate that information to be able to, you know, not have there be, as I think somebody asked about Colorado, if I live in Colorado, I'd like to be able to know that I have an adult clinic or, or a clinic that could help me when I'm an adult as I transition. And I think that can be really, really frustrating. Um, I think thinking about, you know, what does telemedicine look like? Um, as we talk about sharing best practices across our country for people that may have seemingly rare diseases, but lifetime diseases. Thank you. And I just want to clarify, Mike uh, corrected me. It's $45 a day now. And uh, if we get to 11 million in funding, it, it's an additional 21 per person. So still $66 is not that bad uh, for a year. Yeah. And, um, and another thing I would add, I don't want to interrupt you, but I would say yeah. is we talk about spina bifida, but so much of the research and the clinical care improvement that we've learned about is applicable to people with, with spinal cord injuries, so many other um, problems that are different, but similar. So it's not just very specific. And if you think about it, it's not just for people with spina bifida population, but it's anybody who may be spending time in a wheelchair, who may have a neurological injury, many different reasons that would um, th this information is so applicable. Yes. Uh, Diane from Ohio is asking, with the increasing number of adults living with spina bifida, what is the percentage of adults being followed in the registry and is there work being done to increase their participation? Right, so we could go back. Um, to the registry slide, and I'm going to try and see if I can, I don't know if I can get back to it faster than you can. Um, it was, I think, and it was about, you know, of the, I'm trying to pull it up right now to give you the numbers again, because um, I don't want to misquote them. Um, it's umpire, let's see. The registry is right here. It's on slide six. There's 11,800 participants. And so if you look, that there's 65% are under 21. 
um, 17% are over 22. So what happens is a lot of people fall out of the registry once they leave the pediatric population and the spina bifida clinics. And I think everybody here could always talk about, right, what cha the changes that happen when you transition out of a true pediatric spina bifida clinic to see an adult provider who may or may not be part of continuing that registry. Now, if you think you were in the registry as a child, we can certainly work with you and you could talk with Catherine about how to have your adult information potentially become part of that. Well, that's 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 great. That's fascinating. That would be, that's cool. <laughs> Yeah, um, and I think Mike Wood just made a very good point in the chat too um, that went by fast, but was talking about the fact that, you know, we, we don't have the registry itself, even though it does incredible work, it doesn't have the vast majority of people with spina bifida are, are still not in it. And that's because of the lack of clinics as well. So uh, Amy from Boston wants to know, what are the actual steps that can be taken to work towards establishing an adult clinic? For reference, she's in Boston, where there's world-class care for pediatrics, as we all know, but not for adults. And Amy is an, is an, an adult. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, I think we advocate everywhere we can. I shouldn't say advocate. We're not allowed to say we advocate, but we advocate for quality care. Um, we work with everyone from the American College of Physicians, um, which are internists, to um, rehabilitative physicians, neurosurgeons, urologists, to understand how important it is to have that care. Um, I would tell you the thing that I find very frustrating is it doesn't matter what kind of childhood chronic problem you have, when you transition into adulthood, that, that clinic that wrapped around you to help make sure that you had the most successful childhood you know, we're able to go to school, we're as healthy as you could be, kind of falls out from under you. And we as a society need to really push our clinicians who are adults to embrace and care for um, adults who have these issues and understand where to go to, to get help. So I think um, we are working to understand. And I think one of the things we, we need to learn more about is where are their adult clinics at work? What is it that makes them work? Um, I know there's a program in um, Colorado where there it's not specific to spina bifida, but it's specific to people with disabilities where there's a virtual clinic where there are 10 clinicians who agree to work together with patients that have complex needs. So I think it's just so important for the clinical community and with you all as leaders to think about what is working and then how can we talk that about that, magnify that, spread that across the country. I have kind of a three-part question, um, okay. so I'll, I'll help you uh, remember as we go through. Um, how do you get into the registry? How do you participate in ECHO? And can you, you participate in the focus groups if you are not part of a clinic or the registry? So um, those are really good questions. Um, how do you get into the registry? I think you have to be in one of the clinics that's participating in the registry. Um, but, you know, if you, um, again, I showed you guys Catherine's email at the end, we can go back and share that with you all again. Um, if you've been in the in one of the clinics, she can tell you if they're in the registry. And I think we can actually go to the website and look it up too. Um, definitely ECHO is something that people can read and listen and learn. If you're a clinician, um, you have access to all of those and Catherine can get you that link too. Um, but, and I will, what I can do, um, Heidi, is you and I can send out to this group, maybe the links to that. Um, yes. uh, maybe we, we'll get them tomorrow and get them all to you. So people will have them. Cause I'm sure you've got a participant list. We can do that for project echo. And then lastly, the focus groups volunteer. We would love to have people participate in the focus groups. And we, I saw people talking about, there's a big difference between being 24 and being 75, not 75 yet but it's, I'm closer to 75 than I am to 24. And I agree completely. The issues you have, the work you, you know, need to think about, um, the transitions and the parts in your life that are important are different. So we want our focus groups to be diverse, diverse from geography, diverse from different cultures and ethnicities, but also diverse by age and experiences that people have. Great. Thank you for going through all three. Uh, I have another question from Kevin. He wants to know, what are the underlying reasons for lack of clinical support for adults with spina bifida it, within the spina bifida community? And is it a lack of funding or clinicians? 
I think, you know, and this is Karen, I, I would tell you, this is not, um, we, we've done some focus questions on this, but in reality, our, uh, our pediatric system, and I, I'm biased because I'm a pediatrician, is set up to make sure that every child, right, from birth on, has their ultimate opportunity at health and well-being. That is the way the pediatric system is set up. It's the way every children's hospital is set up. Um, so whether you have spina bifida or you have sickle cell disease or you have leukemia, everybody still has that same goal. Our adult system is set up to fix intermittent problems, not chronic disease. And a lot of adult clinicians never trained with children that had complex medical needs aging into their groups. So there's a lack of knowledge and awareness and we have to get them to understand this is part of the practice of medicine and we've got to get people trained up to do that because, and I think, um, Heidi, thank you. You put in the um, spina bifida map for the clinics. Thank you. <laughs> it's yes. wonderful. Um, but you know, you'd like to have the ability to have that, those clinics be able to have reach out to wherever somebody's getting care from spina bifida and gain knowledge from them because you can't have a spina bifida clinic in every single city in our country, but you certainly want to have people with spina bifida have access to that kind of clinical care and expertise. And I am hoping that through telemedicine and other opportunities like ECHO, we'll be able to make that happen. And I'm, I'm going to jump in because I'm a mom and I always, and I'm always here about advocate, advocate, advocate. And I have to remind everyone, make your own clinic. And that's what we did for Shoshana here in South Florida. I just kept telling the doctors, to call the other doctor and it got to the point by the time she was 18, 17, 18, they were texting about Shoshana and they would walk into uh, appointments saying, I just got off the phone with so-and-so. I know what happened at that appointment last week. And they started also handing her off. So it took a lot of work on our part to kind of advocate and tell them to talk to these other doctors that were in the same hospital system. And we basically created our own clinic where she got full care and they even handed over medication management just to one doctor. They all agreed to that. So you have to advocate for yourself. It would be wonderful to have clinics in all 50 states. And we agree with that adult and pediatric. That's not realistic, but make it work for you. I'm sorry. I just always have to jump in and say, you have to do some things yep. yourself. But but I do also think we'll learn through our focus groups and we're very committed to making sure we share that with our adult physician colleagues to make sure they know where the gaps are and how they think about this, right? Um, so I think that is critically important. And they know their limitations, like orthopedics. So they'll say, I, I'm i not the guy. This is the guy. Go to this guy. And it works better. This is a foot guy. You need to see a foot guy. So please go to him. And they set you up. So you just have to, you have to educate too. That's part of advocacy. Um, so uh, just people were asking how to get involved in the focus group. Sarah said this is something that SBA could work with the yep. CDC on. So that will make that happen. Um, I don't think I missed any other questions, but please um, nudge me or drop it in the chat. Um, if you if I did miss one, um, I'm scrolling up real quick to make sure. Um, let's see. Um, uh, someone was asking about the presentation and Mike said, we'll get it out to everyone. Uh, Mike has a question, Mike Wood, where do you Hi, see Mike. the work of, where do you see the work of the spina bifida program going in the next five years? That's a great question. How is our um, funding going to be used? Right. I, I think a lot of continuing work with the clinics, right. Around understanding major issues, quality improvement, what we can do, but just as importantly, um, thinking through what are issues across the lifespan that we that we can use. We now have access to huge amounts of data through electronic health records. Many of you may have heard of EPIC. It's the largest electronic health record in our country. Um, we have access to that information that we've never had before. We're going to learn as a center because, you know, as a center, we take care of lots of rare diseases that occur um, as birth defects or in early infancy. Collectively, they represent a lot of children. Close to 30 to 35% of children have 
chronic medical issues that are very important. So how do we start to learn what are the biggest issues in transition? What are the biggest health problems that may be occurring? You know, when, when somebody says to me, if I have spina bifida, what are the big things I should be thinking about when I'm 30, when I'm 40, when I'm 50? And is it the same as somebody who doesn't have spina bifida, 30, 40, and 50? Or are there different things that influence that? How do I weave that together and understand? Um, and so we're hoping to be able to use those very large data sets to start to share that kind of information. And it can be powerful. An example I'll give to you is we published an article last year saying that of children that had critical congenital heart disease, so these are kids that had major open heart surgery in their first year of life, only 50% as adults were getting the follow-up care that they needed. When I talked to the adult clinicians, they said, oh, no, no, no. And I said, really, let me go grab the paper and send it to you. And they were horrified and are working with their membership organization to teach internists what they need to know and what they should be doing and where they should be referring them. And so I hope we can do that for people with spina bifida to be able to get that information because information can be power um, to be able to inform the clinical community, but also to be able to work with the community of people with spina bifida to understand what are the questions, <clears throat> excuse me, that you want answered, that we may be able to answer when we have access to large data. That's great. Um, Brian made a good point. When he meets with a physician, he likes to ask them questions on um, their knowledge and level of expertise on spina bifida. And also he educates them through his learned lived experiences. Um, that's a good plug for yes. the guidelines that was worked on between SBA and the CDC. So if you want to talk a little bit about the guidelines, this would be a good opportunity. The guidelines for- Oh, I'm sorry. The guidelines for um, clinical care. I thought the CDC, the, the program was involved. It's only SBA did it. It's on our yeah. site. We, we've been, we've been involved in a lot of the funding of the clinics Yes, that information is what is the evidence that goes behind those guidelines, and those guidelines are critically important. But I think the problem I see from the chat and from all of you is what we've got to go is we've got lots of great guidelines, we've got great information through ECHO. We have to make sure clinicians know it is there and feel a responsibility to go there and get that information. And so I think all of you as leaders and advocates in this space, being able to say, and one of the things I'm thinking, um, Sarah, we can work on together is sort of, if I'm an adult with spina bifida and I go in and see an internist who says, you know, I don't know much about this. Here are the five things you can do. Here's where you can go to see the guidelines. Here's where you can go to get, you know, echo education. Here's the things you need to know. And, and we become we're helping them get educated about what they need to know to be able to help us do the best we can for our healthcare. Um, it's a shame we have to do that, but I think maybe that is a, a tool that we can think about how we can develop jointly too. Hi, Sarah. Hi, Karen. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And just to clarify on the guidelines, that was a part of the the clinical care work that, that SBA did. So. Yes. You guys helped to fund that. That was that was the role CDC played in that. I remember there was a connection. I just didn't. Yeah. There's right. always a connection. Yes. <laughs> uh, we have a question from Julia from New York. Uh, does the NCB DDD work with the state birth defect registries that exist? Yes. Yeah. So that's also in our center. So definitely. Um, and they're both in the same division. So we work very closely to understand what they're seeing, what they're learning um, to get that information. But remember, those are only going to get kids that are born with spina bifida that are picked up in that first year of life. So not a cult spina bifida um, that get into those registries and they collect a lot of information from mom and baby early on, but not that lifespan work that we want to also be able to supplement. So good information, really important part of what we gather and get, but but not the whole story. That's great. And kind of following up with what Sarah was just discussing, Mike Wood reminded us that SBA does receive substantial funding from the CDC to partner with them on uh, pushing the research work out. So that is another talking point for us is that the CDC funding helps SBA continue to represent the community as yeah. well. Yeah. So we have about, 
Um, go ahead. Go oh, ahead. I was just going to say, I think when you're talking to them to remind them that this is, you know, this is not a small amount of people in our country and that it is impossible for doctors to know everything about every disease, right? We, we they, they, they're just going to see too many different people. So the more trusted information can be available when you see that patient that can help you find and make sure you, you know, doctors want to do the best job they can do too, most of the time. So you want to make sure they've got the information they need at the right time. And it's always a partnership between that patient and the doctor. And we've got to make sure doctors think of it that way too. Absolutely. So we have about five minutes left of your time. We really appreciate this. I think it's been really helpful. So if there's any more questions, uh, drop them in the chat. And uh, Sam is asking, can you share the ECHO resource so that people can share it with their clinicians? You know what I'm going to do is I would love, Sarah, for you and me to talk with Catherine. And we'll get you guys the links. But more importantly, I think what we need is sort of a one pager that you, you know, that you as a patient could go in and say, hey, maybe the last time you saw somebody with spina bifida was when you did your pediatric rotation when you were in training, here's what's, here's information that's out there that can help you help me make sure that we are doing the best we can for my health and well-being. And I think, um, I think we can work with, with Sarah and SBA and Catherine to think about what that might be. Um, and then I think, you know, if we can get that, we can even test it with our adult physician colleagues, American College of Physicians, who are the internist, the American Academy of Family Practitioners, um, you know, the emergency physicians to say, is this tool helpful? Because, you know, I always like to pick on them because I've been married to them for 40 years, but my husband's a cardiologist and there will be people with spina bifida who will have a cardiology problem and they will go see him. But I don't know that he really understands or knows what are the things I should think about with somebody with spina bifida? And, you know, what are the, what are the things I should think about if they need a test or they need certain things done? And so I think he would be very grateful to have, you know, have a patient come in informed with information that could help them be partners in, in their care. Well, that was part of the reason that we developed a, an, an app for the guidelines so that, and we didn't make it just available to physicians. We made it available to individuals as well, because we wanted people to be able to be armed with information when they went in to visit their their doctor and say, here's something that can help you treat me the way that I need to be treated. So, uh, We have one last question. This is a great one from AJ. Um, within the registry, is there data on the percentage of people who are employed, unemployed, type of insurance coverage, or other difficulties getting medical devices um, covered by insurance? Yeah, there's definitely information about type of insurance. I am not sure if medical devices or employment are in the adult components. Do you know, Sarah? I would have to look at the registry information. And there, we have so many different different disease registries that I wouldn't want to tell you something untrue, but we can follow up with that too. Good question. And that is one of the reasons why we want to get to those even bigger databases, because what, as, as I think Mike Wood pointed out, our registry is great, but it doesn't capture the much larger universe of people with spina bifida. It only captures those that have been able to go to multidisciplinary clinics and continue to be followed into adulthood, right? A very small percentage. And by the fact that they've already been in a spina bifida clinic throughout their childhood and are followed into adulthood tells us that they really have more access than most people with spina bifida have to the kind of care they, they need. So we want to learn more through those electronic health records and those claims and other public available sources about the whole universe of people with spina bifida. Whether you live in South Florida mm -hmm. or Minnesota, or you know, uh you live on a tribal community in, you know, some of the more rural parts of our country, um, making sure we understand what those needs are and what people, what resources we need to bring to bear is so critically important. Wonderful. Again, thank you for taking time out of your Sunday to spend time with us. I hope everyone found this as enlightening as I did. Um, in the local government world, we do this. So I know everyone's behind their screens doing this. We don't clap in the local government meetings. So everyone's probably doing this. Uh, thank you again.
for um, our participants. We're going to take a 15 minute break and we will be, be back on at um, four o'clock. I'm sure Dr. Remley would tell you to hydrate, stretch your yep. limbs <laughs> and uh, go to the bathroom and take care of your kidneys. Thanks everyone. Thank you.